Good morning, church. It's Sunday morning, and we're having a beautiful morning way over here. I hope that you are having a beautiful morning way over there. We, of course, miss you, and we can't wait to see you face to face again. Until then, we will happily stare into this camera and talk so that uh, we can keep each other and our neighbors safe. I want to revisit a text that um, I've spent a lot of time with in my life this week, and you've probably spent a lot of your time in your life with, and we've probably spent some time together with it, although I can't remember this early in the morning exactly how much time we've spent with it. But it came back to me in a fresh way this week, which I'll describe as we go along. But this is a text that you know. It's in the Sermon on the Mount. It is uh, this passage near the beginning of Matthew chapter 5 where Jesus tells those who'd gathered around that they are salt and light. And I want to talk about that for just a few minutes, um, this reflection that I've had on it this week. But it really begins in chapter 4, right? Chapter 4, down about verse um, 17 or 18, is where Jesus begins his ministry. And this is after his baptism in chapter 3. This is after the temptations at the beginning of chapter 4. This is after John the Baptist has been arrested. He, he begins his ministry in the way that Matthew describes uh, summarizes his message is to say that um, it's time to repent because the gospel of or the kingdom of the heavens is at hand. This is for Matthew what the gospel is. Repentance in the face of the arrival of the kingdom of heaven. And then beginning in verse 18 of Matthew chapter 4, going out to demonstrate what the kingdom is and what the kingdom looks like. Jesus was very big on show and tell. He's going to show them in chapter 4 before he tells them about the kingdom in chapter 5. Jesus begins to go all around Galilee in the area and people start coming to him with all sorts of problems and he's teaching and he's healing and he's casting out demons and he's doing all of these wonderful things. And it says as we transition from chapter 4 to chapter 5 that the crowds gather all around him and seeing the crowds uh, who've come to be healed, who have been healed, who have had, cast demon, or have had demons cast out, who... I have come to have demons cast out, so on and so forth. He, he goes up to the mountain, he sits down, and he begins to teach. And again, if chapter 4, beginning in verse 18, is Jesus demonstrating the truth of the kingdom, what he's going to do starting in chapter 5 with the Sermon on the Mount is he's going to begin to declare the truth of the kingdom. You've seen what I've been doing. Now let me tell you what I've been doing is all about. And in the way that Matthew works, the way that Matthew is telling his story, He's trying to uh, set Jesus up as a new Moses. And what Jesus is going to do in his cross and ultimately his resurrection and his ascension is a new Exodus moment. And so um, that works broadly speaking. And so in the way that Matthew is telling the story, the Sermon on the Mount is set up kind of as a new Sinai. This is a new moment with God on the mountain where he establishes a people and he declares, this is what my people are going to be like. And so the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus laying down, if you will, the platform or the foundation for his kingdom. And that's actually where he ends the Sermon on the Mount, right? Uh, that VBS song, The Wise Man Built His House Upon the Rock, if uh, you hear these words of mine and do them at the end of Matthew chapter 7. You are like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. If you hear these words of mine and do not do them, then you are like a foolish man who builds his house upon the sand. And we could all sing the song right now, but um, I'm not going to torture you with that because the only one you would hear is me. But these words of mine, you hear these words of mine, and you do them or you don't do them, these words refer in the context to the Sermon on the Mount. So we have a foundational thing going on. And for a long time, I've looked at the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. This is where the Sermon on the Mount starts. I've looked at the Beatitude as a statement directly to the sort of people that had gathered around Jesus. And so when he talks about the poor in the spirit, that is, if we wanted to parse it out into language that we would use more often, people who are kind of at the end of the rope, people who are without hope, people who had given up. Um, when he talks about those who gr grieve, when he talks about those who um, hunger and thirst for righteousness, which is, which is not a, an expression of personal piety, oh, I pray every day. I read my Bible every day, but someone who in the brokenness of the world is longing for a world that works the way it's supposed to. People who have rubbed up against the ugliness of the world, they're, they're hungering and thirsting for things to work the way they're supposed to. I've long believed that when 
he's saying these things that with that crowd gathered around from the area that he's been working in, he's actually looking those sorts of people in the eye. Uh, when he takes someone who is too crippled to work and heals them so that they can provide for their family again. He is looking at somebody who is without hope and through the action of the kingdom of heaven embodied in Jesus, he is giving them hope. So blessed are you who are hopeless because God is doing something for you in the kingdom. Or for that uh, wife or that child who's father was taken away or mother was taken away even if we wanted to go in that direction because uh, they had leprosy and we were never going to see them again uh, and Jesus heals that leprosy and so he says blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness and you can imagine that reunion when the hep leprosy is is healed and so there's this very direct connection between Jesus and the crowd and uh, for a long time in the Beatitudes, the first several verses of Matthew chapter 5, I have always, uh, for some time now anyway, made that connection. But for whatever reason, I haven't made that connection as explicitly in the verses that follow that. Uh, particularly in verses 13 through 16. And I want to just read that for you and then, then we'll talk a little bit about it for just a minute. Um, after the Beatitudes, this is, this is what Jesus says. He says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how will it become salty again? And it's good for nothing except to be thrown away and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on top of a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on top of a lampstand, and it shines on all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so they can see the good things you do and praise your Father who is in heaven. And so for a long time, I, I looked at this language um, until this week when someone helped me, helped me see the context a little more clearly and make connections. I looked at this language as broadly Israel language. And really, the reason I did that is because in the Old Testament, this is broadly Israel language. If you go back to... The first exodus, and remember that Matthew here is setting up this as a second exodus. Uh, Jesus is the new Moses, right? Um, if you go back to the first exodus, when God draws them across the Red Sea into Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, at the beginning of the giving of the law, what he's going to say to them is, <clears throat> I have brought you here so that you could be a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. And this language is central to understanding Israel's calling. It is central to understanding our calling. But if you want it to, um, and various people in the Old Testament do similar things to this, if you, you want it to tease that out in different terms, what does it mean to be a royal priesthood? What does it mean to be a holy nation? By the time Jesus comes along, one might say, God has called Israel to be salt and light. And salt, of course, was used for a lot of different things in the ancient world. Most of those things were real benefits to the people around them. Sometimes it was used to preserve meat. Sometimes it was used in, in ways that are similar to the way we used it to, um, to add a little flavor to things, so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, salt was used primarily, regardless of the particular use, to be a blessing to those who use it. And so Jesus says, you are... And he's tapping into Israel's vocation here. This is what Israel was always meant to be. It says, you are to be a blessing to the world. And this light of the world, which, by the way, is more explicit in the Old Testament, is the notion that you are to be a beacon to the rest of the world, a, a portent, a um, advanced colony of a different way of doing things. And the, the basic notion in the story of the Exodus is I've drawn you out of Egypt, and if Egypt represents the way the world works, uh, you, Israelites, a slave nation, you should know above all people that the way the world works doesn't really work all that well. So let me give you a different way of doing things. And that's what he's doing in the law. A different way of doing things, a holy nation, a, a different nation amongst the nations. And in being different, what they were meant to do was like a city set on a hill or a light in the darkness. It was meant to, to be a beacon drawing other people, other nations to that way of life. 
And so in one sense, what Jesus is doing in Matthew chapter 5, 13 through 16, is he's drawing Israel back to their vocation. Everybody he's talking to, as far as we know in the text, are Israelites. These are people who live in Judean territories. These are, are people who would have grown up reading Torah and following God and doing as best they can all of the things that God expected them to do. But we also live at a time where Israel, where Judea, by and large, had forgotten for a lot of reasons exactly who they were and what they were there for. This is a theme that runs through all of the Gospels. Uh, they were preoccupied rather than being a beacon to Rome or being a blessing to Rome, uh, just for instance, since Rome was the occupiers, or, or even a beacon to the Samaritans or a blessing to the Samaritans. They were interested in being separate from them and dealing with them as a problem and all manner of other things. They become distracted, and understandably so. I'm not condemning them for that because uh, I think one of the reasons why this text hits me so hard is because we get distracted too. And so I've always seen this as um, kind of a general call. Jesus talking to Israelites who had gathered around saying, you've forgotten who you are. And now in the kingdom of God, we're going to remind you of who you are. And I want, want to call you back to your vocation. But I was listening to a podcast this week and, you know, I commute um, about 10 hours a week. And so I listen to podcasts. And one of my favorites is this podcast called The Vox Podcast with um, Mike Erie. He's got a lot of good stuff going on for him. He's doing a series on the Sermon on the Mount right now. He's based it on, or it was inspired by, in part, this new book that Lee Camp wrote. And, of course, we know Lee Camp. He teaches up at Lipscomb. He's the host of Tokens. And so there's that connection that I enjoy, too. But Mike is talking about this text this week. And one of the things that he says that really just struck home with me and brings me to uh, this text this morning is that he says that Jesus isn't talking to Israel in general. We need to remember that when Jesus is talking at any point in the sermon, he's talking to a particular group of people, not some generic Israelite, but he's talking to the people that gathered around him in Matthew chapter 4, the people who he pronounced blessings on at the beginning of chapter 5, those who were hopeless, those who were hungry and thirsting for righteousness, those who were grieving, those who were persecuted, these are, uh, if we wanted to summarize the Beatitudes, those who in their day, in their context, would have been considered the losers. They're the ones who have no power, who have no social prestige, who have no status, who have not been, been cast out and pushed aside, who those who have power and prestige kind of look down on them. They're the ones that everybody kind of looks at suspiciously, right? Um, there was a general category for them among the Pharisees. They're the sinners, many of them. And so these are the losers. And he says that when you're talking to anyone in the Sermon on the Mount, you're talking to that group of people. So when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, he's not saying um, just all you Israelites are the salt of the earth and all you Israelites are the light of the world. But rather, he's looking people in the eye and saying, you as a group, you who have been blessed in the Beatitudes, you who have gathered around for healing, you who have had to beg because you haven't been able to work, you who have lost loved ones and have come up against the brokenness of the world more times than you care to know, you for whom life is not comfortable or orderly or put together, you who the religious establishment and the powers that be have kind of cast aside and given up on, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. He was calling a particular group of people to embody Israel's vocation, a, a particular subset of Israelites to embody the vocation of Israel overall. And these were not the people that anybody would have picked. These are not the people that any um, church planting guru or surely any Pharisee or definitely not any Sadducee would have chosen to carry out the mission of God. The Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Essenes, um, who were a group that weren't talked about much in the New Testament or at all in the New Testament, but they were alive and active at the time of Jesus, lived out in the desert, keeping themselves pure for the coming of the kingdom of God so that they wouldn't be sullied by the world. They, they wouldn't have chosen these kind of people. These people aren't good enough. They're not smart enough. They're not pure enough. They're not religious enough. And yet here they are gathered around the feet of God. The feet of God in the flesh. And he says to those people, 
you are salt and you are light and what makes it powerful is that those people would have been taught all of their life they would have assumed they would have known in their bones that of course Israel is supposed to be salt of course Israel is supposed to be light but that's not for us that's what the Pharisees do and that's what the Sadducees do and that's what the Essenes do we're just the people out here who are losers they're the ones who are doing what God wants them to do and Jesus comes to this ragtag group of people who are broken and who are bruised and who have messed up in their life and who have things dumped on them in their life that they never asked for who struggle to make it from day to day, who are not put together, who if they answered honestly coming to church, how are you doing? They would never say, fine, or blessed. Hit my table just for emphasis. Of course, that wasn't on purpose. <laughs> um, but he comes to this group of people who have absolutely nothing going for them, and he says, it is through you that God intends to bless the world. And it is through you that God intends to draw the nations to himself, his glorious light in the midst of this darkness. And in declaring this, Jesus tells us something important about God. It's, it's not unlike what he says, in, or what Paul says, rather, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, down about halfway through 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul starts talking about the cross of Christ. This is a text you're familiar with. He, he talks about how the cross is <clears throat> foolishness to those who are wise and how the cross is weakness to those who are strong. But then he points out that the cross declares that the weakness of God is stronger than the strength of the world and that the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of the world. It is through the foolishness and the powerlessness of the cross that God declares his wisdom and his strength. And at first Paul's just talking about Jesus. This is what God did with Jesus on the cross, but then he turns around to the church and he says, the same principle is at work with you Corinthians. He says, when you look at what God has done among you, you'll see that he has not called many who are wise and he's not called many who are strong. The God that works through the foolishness of the world and through the weakness of the world is the same God at work in the church in you through those same principles. This is how God works. And so Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, salt and light, he teaches us something important about how he works in the world. It's not through the halls of power. It's not through those who have managed through their own merits and strength and supposed virtues to climb to the top of the ladder. It's not with the most money or with the most votes or with the biggest bombs. Jesus works through, God works through, God does his redemptive vocation through sorts of people who gather around Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. It's not through power, but through powerlessness. It's not through the wisdom of the world, but through the foolishness of the world. It's not through strength, but through weakness. It's not through social prestige, but it's the losers he's working in. And I say that term, by the way, affectionately. And if you stop and think about it for more than just a second, that one facet of who God is is instructive in so many ways. And one of the reasons I'm coming to this text this morning is I'm struggling to figure out how to preach right now because 2020 is wild, man. Uh, we have so many things going on, so many things. That they say that preachers, when they teach us to preach, they said you want the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. You're drawing this bridge between the Word of God and the world so that we can live it out. There's just so many things going on in our world right now. We have our pandemic, we have social unrest, we have racial injustice, we have an election coming up, we have all of this, the fears and the insecurities that come with all of those things. We have high unemployment. We, I mean, this list just keeps going, right? And we're seeking and we're, we're in a year where so many solutions are offering themselves to these problems, but those solutions are offering themselves to these problems in a culture that is enamored with power. If only we can get more votes than the other people, if only we can shout louder than the other people, if only we can silence, if only we can cancel, 
them. And by the way, cancel culture, um, don't judge your cancel culture friends to the left of you too harshly. They learned it from those of us who grew up in traditional religious environments like the Church of Christ, where we have been canceling people for years. But it's that same impulse. Let's just get some power over those people. And in the midst of all of this clamoring for power, the clamoring to be in charge, the clamoring to be the winners, the clamoring to have the most social prestige, to pull the levers of influence in the world, Jesus is the one who comes into the world and says it's through the losers that I'm going to do my business. It's through the broken that I'm going to change the world. It's through the powerless that I am going to make a difference. And Jesus really begins to embody, remember the Sermon on the Mount is a foundational thing here. The Sermon on the Mount is, is the heart of what Jesus is doing in the kingdom of God. Jesus embodies completely different way of approaching things. And so the kingdom of God is that opportunity for us to remember that um, an election year, we have an opportunity to vote for this person over here, or this person over here. And as we fuss and fight about that, we seldom remember that voting on one side versus the other is really climbing out on different limbs up the same tree. But what Jesus came into the world to do was to cut down the tree that doesn't work in the first place and to plant a better one. And it's not singing the same old song the world sings in a slightly different way, putting some sort of Christian veneer or kind of baptizing it so it looks virtuous or sprinkling Jesus' name or the Spirit's name or a prayer here and there over it. But he's going to teach us an entirely new song. And it's not playing the same old game by a slightly different set of rules, but he is going to teach us an entirely new game because the old game the way things are hasn't worked out very well. And in the midst of all of that, we are in the world not to clamor for power, not to try to get prestige, not to try to get more votes or to have more money than anybody else, not to out shout or out bomb or out legislate those with whom we disagree, but we are the ones who have been called to be losers in the world, to lay our power down And in doing so, take up the way of Jesus where we learn how in drastically different ways to be salt and light. But the implication of Jesus' text is clear. Every time we try to take up the way of the Sadducees or the Pharisees or Rome, who, by the way, consider themselves to be the salt and light of the world in their own ways... Whenever we go that path, we lose our saltiness. And whenever we go that path, we are like a light hiding under a bushel. And what good are those? So let me pray for you, and then I'm going to ask you to pray with me, and then we're going to remember who we are. And this confession we make every week and this prayer we pray every week, these are, by the way, uh, central to the notion of being God's weak and foolish people in the world. They give us our marching orders. And so let's remember who we are. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that in the midst of the darkness you have sent light. That in the midst of the brokenness you have sent us a healer. We simply pray for the courage to follow him as backwards and antithetical to the way the world works as it may be. Lord, we believe. Help us in our unbelief. And now we come to you as a family and we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. 
We shall love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul, with all our mind and with all our strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second commandment is like it. We shall love our neighbor as ourselves. And all of the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. We love because God first loved us. Anyone who says that they love God but hates their brother or sister is a liar. How are you going to love God, whom you have never seen, if you don't love your brother or sister who is right in front of you? So this is the command we have from him. Those who love God must also love their brother or sister. Have a good week, church.